My name is Ben Chandran. I'm visiting from the University of New Hampshire. And I'll be talking to you today about solar wind structure and turbulence. And actually, it's going to be mostly about turbulence. I'll talk a little bit about solar wind structure uh, and then move on into uh, the basics of turbulence, measurements of solar wind turbulence, then a theoretical model of solar wind turbulence based on magnetohydrodynamics. And then at the end, I'll talk about a slightly modified version of MHD turbulence. Uh, it's an inhomogeneous version of MHD turbulence that involves wave reflections that we believe may be very important for understanding the origin of the solar wind. So as a sort of overarching motivational kind of thing to say at the beginning, there is going to be an important punchline at the end from what you'll learn in this, uh, in this talk. But we have a lot of hard work to do to get there. So when I was pre preparing this, I originally had kind of the, the kind and gentle version of this talk, which I was going to bring. And it's kind of easy to follow. And you'd all feel good afterwards. And then I thought, no, I don't really want to do that. Because in, in a lot of conferences, you'll go to um, solar wind turbulence talks, and you won't really understand what people are talking about. There's so, so much jargon flying around, so many ideas that if you're not in the field, you won't understand them. So, what I thought I would do here is make this more useful to you, but unfortunately also more painful for you. And I want to go through some of the nitty gritty that you need to understand if you're going to follow those talks and conferences. And so we will do that. As a compromise, we're going to start that maybe halfway to 2 thirds of the way through. So you'll have some nice time to kind of relax after lunch and feel good. And then I'll give you the break. And then after the break, the pain will begin. Before I begin, I um, uh, just want to mention some collaborators. Most of what I'm going to say today is tutorial, uh, not related to new research. But some of it towards the end is going to touch upon areas of current research. And uh, I want to acknowledge the, the many collaborators I'm working with from whom I'm continually learning about this subject. All right. So as you learned this morning, and as many of you knew before coming here, the solar wind is basically a quasi-continuous, quasi-radial outflow of plasma from the sun. It's fast, supersonic, superalphanic. That means that the outflow speed is greater than the sound speed, greater than the alphane speed near Earth. Typical speeds 300 to 800 kilometers a second near Earth. Temperatures 10 to the fifth Kelvin, few particles per cubic centimeter near Earth. A plasma, as you know, is like a gas of charged particles. It behaves like a fluid. But the charged particles generate electric and magnetic fields, and in turn are affected by these electric and magnetic fields. So in relation to the sun, you can think of the solar wind as just the expansion of the solar atmosphere. So here is showing you the interior cross-section of the sun, uh, the solar uh, core, where fusion occurs, as you were learning about this or talking about this morning. Uh, outside of the core, you have the radiative zone, where energy is transported outwards primarily by radiation. If you go to about 2 thirds of the way out by radius, you enter the convection zone. That outer third of the sun's interior by radius is unstable and convective, constantly churning. And that gives rise to this granulation on the sun's surface. Then you have the solar atmosphere. The chromosphere is the first layer, narrow layer above the photosphere, just uh, you know, a few thousand kilometers thick. The solar radius is about 700,000 kilometers. Above the chromosphere, you have the corona, which extends out a few solar radii, and then outside of that, the solar wind. The solar wind doesn't carry a ton of energy based, uh, com in comparison to the electromagnetic radiation. It's about one part in 10 to the sixth of the sun's total energy output. The mass loss rate carried by the solar wind is about one part in 10 to the 14 of a, the sun's mass per year. So at the current rate of mass loss, the solar wind is not going to carry away a big part of the sun's mass over its expected 10 billion year lifetime. The sun, of course, later on is going to enter a different stage of evolution, which will have a stronger wind and outflow. And mass loss will become more important, but that's a story for another time. So another thing you were learning about this morning is the solar cycle. So this is another way of envisioning the solar cycle. Uh, plotted here in this graph is the average daily sunspot area on the sun as a percentage of the total area versus time, going back to the late 1800s to 2010. And this is the, the, you know, how much area on the sun was covered by these sunspots, a particular sunspots illustrated here. Again, most of you will know this, but what is a sunspot? It's an area where you have a very strong magnetic field in the sun's surface. That strong magnetic field is strong enough that it inhibits that convection I was talking about earlier. Well, what does that do? Well, the convection is bringing up hotter material from underneath to the surface. If you inhibit that convection, 
you're not having as much hot material coming up. And so the area gets relative to the surrounding, it's, it's cooler inside that very strong magnetized area. It appears dark in the visible light. Uh, and so there's a sunspot. And you can see that the area of the sunspots peaks once every 11 years. That's associated with the solar cycle in which the sun's magnetic field reverses direction once per 11 years. It's then a 22-year cycle. And we refer to the times at which you have maximal sunspot area, that's solar maximum, the maximum of the solar cycle. The times when you have the least sunspot area are, is the, the solar minimum, the minimum of the cycle. And it turns out that the structure of the solar wind, the 3D structure of the solar wind, depends upon where you are in this solar cycle. So this is a picture that you saw this morning. Also, uh, at a time of solar minimum, you, you've seen this before. This is data from the Ulysses spacecraft during one of its orbits around the sun. What, this is a polar plot. So distance from the origin out to the curve represents the speed that Ulysses, the spacecraft, measured when it was at that heliographic latitude. Up at high latitudes above the sun's pole, you know, north pole and below the south pole, the, the speed is very high, seven to 800 kilometers a second. That's the fast solar wind, the so-called fast solar wind. During most of the solar cycle, it fills most of the volume. So it's considered just basically the ambient background, solar, the, the basic state of the flow. At lower heliographic latitudes, including the ecliptic plane, at solar minimum, the, the wind is slower. The typical speed, 300 to 500 kilometers a second, that's the slow solar wind. The fast solar wind emanates from these big polar coronal holes. The slow solar wind may be from the boundaries of those coronal holes or low latitude coronal holes or possibly other uh, you know, the tops of closed magnetic structures as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, as well. The slow solar wind is in general less well understood than the fast solar wind, uh, something that's a very active subject of research. Now here's the corresponding plot near solar maximum. So this was a subsequent orbit of the Ulysses spacecraft around the sun. And now you can see fast wind and slow wind alternating at all latitudes. So basically, the lesson is the 3D structure of the solar wind is much more complex near solar maximum, which is not entirely surprising. Yes, question? Yes. So this is a great question. So this is like a selection bias. So most of our satellites are in the ecliptic plane, the plane of all the planets' orbits around the sun. And that is in, if you go back to this state, this page here, the slide, we are sitting in this region, which is a, a minority of the volume, but that's where most of our measurements are. So we think of it as the slow wind is more common. But actually, you know, if we could sample all of it, we would see that most of the volume is actually fast wind um, most of the time. All right. So one question is, why is the fast wind fast? Why is the slow wind slow? What is the difference that between these two types of winds? So here is uh, coming a you know, pretty uh, you know, kind of interesting idea, not totally, not totally obvious idea. This goes back to actually to work uh, done by Lear and Holzer in late 70s, maybe 1980. But I'm showing you here a picture from a, a paper by Steve Cramer on the same topic. Shown here is a picture of the magnetic field lines coming out of the sun. You can see these, the north polar coronal hole here, the south polar coronal hole here, closed magnetic structures at lower latitudes. And you can see the following difference between polar field lines and field lines that feed closer to the ecliptic plane. The ones up here, they don't spread apart from each other very quickly. Right? They're almost going up like radially. But look at these two field lines, C and D. They separate very rapidly at low distances from the sun. They separate very rapidly in the corona. We call that super radial expansion within the corona. They're separating more quickly than radial lines would separate. Now, what does that do? As you learned this morning, the energy input into the corona is driving this outflow. And also, you learn that basically mass flux along a, ma a magnetic flux tube in this near sun region is basically a constant with distance from the sun. And that means the density times the speed times the cross sectional area is independent of radius in a steady state. So, here, where the area is growing rapidly, the area between line C and D, the cross sectional area of the flow is growing rapidly with radius the speed is not going to grow as rapidly. 
It's like the, the opposite of the analogy you heard this morning, where uh, Professor Longcope was saying when he's out on the yellow snow, when he gets to a narrowing part of the river, the speed of the, the flow goes up. Well, if you get into a very wide part of the river, the speed of the flow goes down. That's what's happening here. So you get low down near the sun, kind of slow outflow. Now, the reason why that's important may not be the one you think. The reason why that's important here is not that that's the, the speed that you're going to sense far away. It's a different reason. The reason is that it has to do with the competition between the energy that's carried out to the distant solar wind and the energy that's conducted back to the sun. So in all of this region, along all these field lines, electron thermal conduction brings energy back to the sun. Now, up here above the North Pole, where the cross-sectional area is not growing very rapidly, this is like the, the narrow part of the Yellowstone, or, you know, the Yellowstone River, the flow is going fast. There's less ability for thermal conduction to bring energy back to the sun because the, all the thermal energy is being invected up. But down here in this wide area here where the flow is slow, conduction has a much easier time bringing energy back to the cooler chromosphere. And so you lose energy from the plasma here. And there's less energy per particle at infinity. At infinity, by which I mean at large distances from the sun, for example, out near Earth, almost all of the energy is in the form of the bulk flow kinetic energy. So if down here you've taken away 50% of the energy per particle via conduction, your speed out at Earth is going to be reduced by square root of 2, basically. So you have less. Those numbers I'm just pulling out of the air. Those aren't supposed to represent the actual numbers. They're not terribly far off. But the point is here that the, the super radial expansion of these particular flux tubes that are near the boundaries of the coronal holes slows down the flow near the sun, enabling conduction to remove energy from the wind that slows down the flow at infinity. So that's one model for why the slow wind is slow. It's a, sort of an important idea. It ties it into magnetic geometry. All right, so that was the brief discussion of solar wind structure that I wanted to include at the beginning of this talk before moving on to turbulence. Any questions before I continue? Yes. This one here? Yes. You're, you're, uh, the question was, what about this line down here? Are you thinking that here you're going to have acceleration because it's compressing or something? Well, th what you're not seeing here is that there's another closed loop here. And in fact, there's another field line that will be coming from here down here and then like this. And so actually, there will be a range of superradial expansion factors, but you don't in these, it depends on the magnetic field model, but they don't actually have uh, sort of big compressions here. It, it may, I'm not sure where the superradial expansion factor actually peaks. It looks like it might be up here. But still down here, it's not going to really help you get a fast flow. That's a good question. All right, I'm going to mention one other thing. Uh, not so much for the next couple parts of the talk, but particularly when the talk starts to get a bit more difficult later on. It will work best if you ask questions when, uh, whenever you have them. Because I have 103 slides. That's probably too much to go through in a healthy manner. And I'm OK if I have to skip parts in towards the end of the talk, particularly. Um, but uh, And I'm fine if we get through part of it. Much more valuable will be if you understand the part we do go through. So you know, the next two parts are still kind of more introductory. But later on, definitely interrupt with questions. And you don't, if I don't see you and don't call on you, just shout out your question. I, um, you don't need to wait for me to call on you. All right, so turbulence. What is turbulence? So it, let's use an operational definition for turbulence. And what I will mean by turbulence here is uh, disordered motions spanning a large range of length scales and or time scales. So the canonical example here is in hydrodynamic turbulence, where you could imagine a big container of water. Stir up some big eddy in that or water. So you have a big ore. You stir it up. What's going to happen? Well, that big eddy is going to break up into smaller eddies. And those eddies are going to break up into even smaller eddies. And actually, if you just kept stirring, what's going to happen is in that one container of water, you're going to have actually eddies of all these different sizes at the same time. 
So smaller eddies nested in bigger eddies nested in even bigger eddies. And so you, you have that motion spanning a large range of length scales, because you have lots of different eddy sizes. Now you can think about this process of eddy breakup in the following abstract way. This rectangle here represents your system, in quotes, whatever it is. It could be water, it could be plasma. You put energy into this system by stirring. That's this energy input. Then energy, quote unquote, cascades to small scales. This is maybe the favorite word of turbulence researchers, the cascade. What is it? Well, it's the transport of energy from one scale to another. In this case, large scales to small scales. That's this process where eddies are breaking up into smaller eddies. Now, eventually, a small enough si eddy size, viscosity stops the eddies from turning over. Viscosity gets more and more efficient as the scale size gets smaller. And what happens eventually is that these eddies dissipate, generating heat, and that can heat your system. Or if we're talking about plasma, that can heat the solar wind or the solar corona. Now, in plasmas, as opposed to hydrodynamics, uh, turbulence involves electric fields, magnetic fields, as well as the velocity. And so actually, you'll have electric and magnetic fluctuations spanning a broad range of, of length scales. Also, the basic building blocks of the turbulence in plasmas are not eddies so much as plasma waves or plasma wave packets or plasma eddies, which include electric and magnetic fields. So it's a bit more complicated than that picture that we just saw. But a lot of the ideas from hydroturbulence we can borrow in discussing plasma turbulence. And it, that's actually very useful to do. And I will do it in the second half of this talk. All right, where does turbulence occur? Atmosphere, for those of you who, like me, flew in, was it last night? Um, and there was a big thunderstorm over Denver. You probably felt the turbulence uh, on your plane flight. Uh, also in oceans, uh, you know, you have uh, turbulence in, in the oceans, in, in the sun, the convection that I was describing earlier. The solar wind is turbulent, interstellar medium. Intracluster plasmas and clusters of galaxies, actually almost ubiquitously in the universe, we have turbulent plasmas, actually turbulent magnetized plasmas. So they occur all over the place. Turbulence occurs all over the place. What causes it? Different ideas. Uh, one is a kind of stirring I was just talking about. You can get a system where you actually stir the turbulence uh, you know, manually. Or it could be instabilities. There could be some source of free energy in your system which amplifies fluctuations. And an example there is convection. There is, there's a buoyancy instability where hot gas can rise up uh, because the temperature gradient has become, has become steep enough inside the star. A requirement for turbulence is that the medium can't be too viscous. So if you stir a cup of coffee, you can stir your cream into your coffee, and it looks you know, turbulence, and the mixing goes, looks turbulent, and the mixing looks fine. If you stir a jar of honey, you don't get the same effect, because there's too much viscosity or paint, and it's not going to work as well. What does it do? All right, so turbulence does a few things. As I was just alluding to with cream and coffee, it can mix. Uh, something which is dissolved in your fluid. It can mix it together. So if you put a dollop of cream on one side of your coffee cup and stir, you aren't just going to get a swirl of cream going around your coffee cup. But the eddies that are created in that coffee are going to mix the cream in down to the microscale, down to very small scales. And eventually, you'll just have a smooth mixture of cream and coffee together in your cup. And that's an example of turbulent mixing. You also have pollutants in the atmosphere. Turbulent heating, uh, as I was mentioning before, when the smallest eddies dissipate, whether via viscosity in water or by some other mechanism in a plasma, that can generate heat, raising, raising the temperature uh, of the medium. So that's the sort of gentle introduction to turbulence. I'm just going to grab my cell phone so I have a clock here. Let's turn now to how do we measure turbulence uh, in the solar wind. So um, the typical situation we have is we have a spacecraft sitting out in the solar wind. Uh, and I've illustrated one here in the ecliptic plane. Here's the sun. Say Earth is not far from the spacecraft. And we're going to make measurements at the spacecraft's uh, location. And we're going to use the standard RTN coordinates. So R is distance from the sun. T is the tangential direction. So 
Think about state, state spherical polar coordinates. T is the sort of cylindrical or azimuthal coordinate uh, going, say, along the direction of a circular orbit. And N is perpendicular to the RT plane. So in this spherical coordinates would be like the theta direction, for example. And in this case, technically the minus theta direction. But you, you get the, the point. Orthogonal coordinates. Uh, a number of spacecraft have measured turbulence in the solar wind. For example, the Helios, ACE, WIND, Stereo space, spacecraft have all done this. And these spacecraft measure a number of quantities in the solar wind. Velocity of the plasma, magnetic fields, electric fields, the density of the plasma, temperature of the plasma, also distribution functions, velocity distribution functions are measured. That's something that you'll be talking about and hearing about more tomorrow. Here's an example of some spacecraft measurements of the magnetic field and the velocity from the Mariner 5 spacecraft. This is from a, from a paper by Belcher and Davis in 1971. And what you're seeing here, I unfortunately have cut off the, uh, there are labels on the right, but I'll, I'll show you this picture again later in the talk and you'll see. But um, the top panel is the radial component of the magnetic field, the, the T component, tangential component of the magnetic field, and the N component of the magnetic field. Down here is the total field strength and the total density. Actually, this is kind of interesting. You can see that although these magnetic field components are going all over the place, the total field strength isn't changing very much, and the total density isn't changing very much. It's kind of interesting. We'll come back to the significance of that. There are actually two curves up here at the top. One is the magnetic field curve, and the other is actually a velocity curve. It's a plasma velocity curve. Uh, that would, and that's what you're missing over here. There should be a label that says VR, VT, and VN. Uh, I'll show that to you when I re-show you this figure later in the talk. But what's interesting, as you see in this particular example, is that the, the velocity curve is lying almost on top of the magnetic field curve for each of those three components. One thing that I want to actually mention is that this is actually not the magnetic field itself. It's a magnetic field divided by the square root of 4 pi times the mass density, which converts the magnetic field into a velocity unit. Uh, like if you took the, the magnetic field divided by the square, <coughs> excuse me, square root of 4 pi rho is the, what's called the alphane speed. That's the speed at which the, the alphane wave propagates. I'll mention more about alphane waves in a little while. All right, so here's just some data. So let's ask a first question about this data. Is it turbulent? Okay, so what's our operational definition of turbulence? It has to have fluctuations, say velocity fluctuations spanning a large range of length scales and time scales. Well, I can see some fluctuations. Do they span a large range of length scales and time scales? It's not obvious, right, that they do. How can we really tell? Well, there's a quantitative way we can tell, which is by examining the so-called power spectrum of these fluctuations. And by the way, here are those missing labels, VR, VT, and VN. Oh, actually, you know what? Yeah. This is the actual, the actual components of the magnetic field. So actually, the rest of them. Yes, they are, on t they are on top of each other, the velocity and the magnetic field. And actually, I misspoke before. Not having, seen the, uh, not having seen these tick marks here on the velocity axis, it looks like this is probably the magnetic field itself that's being plotted, presumably in nanotesla, uh, because the units aren't the same. But if you were to divide the magnetic field by the square root of 4 pi rho, my assertion is that then the curves would still it would be on top of each other, even if we use the exact same tick marks for the left and right-hand side of the plots. I'll come back to this correlation. Don't worry too much for the moment about this fact that the two curves lie right on top of each other. We'll come back to this in a few moments. For the, for the moment, I just want to talk about whether or not this is even turbulence. Let's talk about this power spectrum. So if you go to a turbulence talk at AGU or the Shine Conference, or a magnetospheric physics conference, you are undoubtedly going to hear about the power spectrum of various quantities, probably the magnetic field. What do, we what do we mean by this? Well, first we take that time series of the magnetic field data, and we take its Fourier transform, uh, a finite Fourier transform, given by this formula. F is what we'll call frequency. And then the power spectrum is going to be related to B tilde of F. B tilde of F is the Fourier transform of the magnetic field. Power spectrum is basically the modulus squared. Actually, I really should have had a uh, complex conjugate here. 
Oh, no, no, the minus f is there. So it, it, this is actually the complex conjugate of the magnetic field here, dotted with a ma magnetic field Fourier transform, dotted with a magnetic field Fourier transform. You get a positive definite quantity, divide by t. Do your best to make your integration window as big as you can, ideally infinite. In spacecraft data, we can't make it infinite. So we just make it as large as we can. And then this is the power spectrum of the magnetic field. So what is it? Well, as you know from studying Fourier transforms, presumably in some other context, B of F, B tilde of F, the Fourier transform of B, is, can be thought of as basically the part of the magnetic field that fluctuates at frequency F. So you can think about the magnetic field as being built up of a sum of a whole bunch of waves that have different frequencies. The Fourier transform is just the amplitude at that particular frequency. One of my students in one of my sophomore physics classes once said that he understood it as uh, B of T is your cake and B tilde is your recipe. I thought that was actually pretty good for, for an analogy. All right, and this, this average here would indicate ideally an average over many such measurements. However, in practice, we might not do that. We might just take T to be large and not average over many measurements and just have P of F be that limit. All right, if we do that, for this data, we get something that looks like this. We plot here. This is actually not the exact same data I showed you before. This is actually different data, for this time from the Helios spacecraft. This is from a paper by Bruno and Carbone. Uh, this is showing you the power spectra at three different distances from the sun. One AU, of course, is the mean distance from the sun to the Earth. So 0.3 AU, that was the closest that any spacecraft had been to the sun until about a year ago. Uh, and you see at then also at 0.7 AU, 0.9 AU, three different distances, you get three different spectra that have these power law scalings. In fact, one power law at low frequencies and a different power law at higher frequencies. In either case, a power law that spans orders of magnitude and frequency. So that is almost like the canonical example of a system with fluctuations spanning a large range of length scales. That's a system which has some variable, say magnetic field, whose power spectrum has a power loss scaling over decades in, say, frequency, or it could be wave number. So indeed, this is trivial. Yes? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, well, it can. It, it, it can be negative. And in fact, when we did, if we were to do the inverse transform here, we'd have to have negative frequencies. You can see, if I took the, the complex conjugate of both sides of this equation, what would happen? Well, on the right, B itself is a real variable. The only thing that's complex is this exponential. And I just switch the e to the 2 pi i f t into e to the minus 2 pi i f t. But that's just the complex, if, if I did that, that's just the same thing, B evaluated now at negative F. Uh, well, you know, in physical meaning of a negative frequency, you know, when we think about frequency as, you know, rates per, you know, oscillations per second, we think of that as a sort of modulus of a frequency. But mathematically, when you do these Fourier transforms, you have to have the negative frequencies in there to make your inverse transform give you a real variable. So I, I would say that when you think about the physical meaning of a frequency, focus just on its absolute value. But in, in practice, you have both positive and negative frequencies when you take a Fourier transform. All right. So great, we have turbulence. All right. Next question for you is, what is causing these time variations that you're seeing in this data? What does that correspond to? Are we thinking about, OK, here's a solar wind, and if I were sitting in the solar wind, at rest with respect to the solar wind, that these are the types of time oscillations that I'd see in that reference frame? Or maybe not. It turns out it's the maybe not. In fact, these variations in the spacecraft frame, time variations in the spacecraft frame, have almost nothing to do with the time variations that you would experience if you looked at the solar wind from the plasma frame. If you were in a spacecraft that was moving out from the sun at the same speed as the solar wind, that plot of B versus time would look completely different. Let me explain what I mean. So this comes to the following couple ideas. So let's go first to this idea 
that we are in the solar wind plasma frame. So we're in, a, we're in a spacecraft that's moving out from the sun at the same velocity as a solar wind. And let's imagine we have a simple wave. It could be a sound wave, for example. So here's my waveform. And it's traveling to the right at, at speed V phase. And so if I put a detector here and I ask what will be the, the sort of say, period of the oscillations of that sound wave, well, it would be the time it would take for one wavelength of the wave to flow past my fixed location here, lambda over V phase. Now, V phase for sound wave, or also an alphane wave near Earth, is typically about 30 kilometers a second. And if I converted this into a frequency, basically one over a period, or an angular frequency, which is 2 pi over um, the, the period, uh, the angular frequency would actually be k times the V phase. If you recall the connection between wave number and wavelength, k, the wave number, is 2 pi over the wavelength. Uh, but basically, this is saying here that the thing that I was just saying in words about the period of that wave would be the time it takes one wavelength to flow past my fixed detector in this frame. All right. How about in the actual case, where we actually have a uh, a spacecraft sitting out in the solar wind taking measurements. Well, in this case, the spacecraft is not in the plasma frame. The spacecraft is, say, sitting at some fixed radius from the sun, say, 1 AU. The solar wind is going by not at um, measly 30 kilometers a second like that sound wave. It's going by at, say, 400 kilometers a second. The solar wind is blasting past us at this huge speed. So let's ask again now, what would be the period that we'd measure in this satellite of this particular sound wave? Well, the sound wave is now moving to the right at a speed which is the sum of those two speeds. So 30 kilometers a second for the sound velocity, 400 kilometers a second for the solar wind velocity. This waveform is now shooting by us at 430 kilometers per second. It's going to have a very short period, right? It's not going to take very long for one wavelength to sweep past us. In fact, the amount of time it takes, so we'll measure some oscillating, say, pressure, if this is a sound wave, or density in our satellite when we look at this. But if we try to interpret the physical origin of that oscillation, it's not because the origin is not going to be the intrinsic time variation in the plasma frame. It actually has to do with only the spatial variation in the plasma frame. In fact, I could take the exact same wave pattern, freeze it in the plasma frame by shutting off this phase velocity. That whole structure would still be advected past me at 400 kilometers a second, and I'd still see an oscillating density. In fact, it's very difficult for us, using spacecraft, single spacecraft measurements, to say anything at all about this tiny V phase because it's swamped by the solar wind advection velocity. So the key takeaway of this slide is the following. If you look at a time signal at a fixed spacecraft, single spacecraft in the solar wind, you'll get a time variation. That time variation is telling you about the spatial variation of the quantity you're measuring in the solar wind, in the solar wind frame. You know, if we see a time variation, it's telling us about the wavelength of this wave. Basically, the wavelength is going to be the period that we measure times the solar wind speed. It's going to have nothing to do with the sound speed in the solar wind. That has to do with Taylor's frozen flow hypothesis, which basically says, OK, to interpret these solar wind measurements, these turbulence measurements, imagine that the flow, whether it's density, magnetic field, velocity, imagine it's just frozen in the plasma frame. And the whole thing is like a, you know, it's just like a fixed picture that's going past you. And you're just measuring different slices of that picture at different times. That's what you're seeing when you see solar wind data. So really, when we talk about frequency spectra like this, in reality, we can map this frequency to wave number, to, to spatial structure in the solar wind. All right. Coming back to this picture I showed you before, as I was commenting before, the two lines in each panel, this top one is one of the lines is the magnetic field, the other is the velocity in the R direction for the second panel. That's B and V in the tangential direction, the T direction. And here it's B and V in the N direction. Those pairs of curves are highly correlated. So 
what does that mean? Keep that idea in mind as we now turn to uh, the next topic in this talk, uh, magnetohydrodynamic turbulence. So the basic idea here is that we have now these measurements. We know that the solar wind is a plasma. We need some kind of theoretical framework that can help us interpret these measurements, some kind of modeling that can give us some ideas for what these measurements really mean. Magnetohydrodynamics is a good choice for understanding at least parts of the properties of, of solar wind turbulence. What is magnetohydrodynamics? Let me just actually see a show of hands. How many of you have studied MHD in a course in the last three years? OK, so probably two thirds of you. I'll give you the introduction for the other thirds and even the two thirds who have had it. Um, you know, maybe this will be somewhat useful. So basically, most of the phenomena that I'm describing in those plots and showing you are at length scales exceeding about 300 kilometers, time scales exceeding 10 seconds. So the time scale of one second in one of those plots actually corresponds to one second times the solar wind speed in terms of a spatial length. Like if you have a, a signal that goes by your, your fixed spacecraft, and that signal, say the magnetic field goes from minus five nanotesla up to five nanotesla in one second. And you ask, okay, well, from Taylor's frozen flow hypothesis, that must mean that in the solar wind frame, the plasma had a, a magnetic field going from minus five nanotesla up to plus five nanotesla over some distance. Well, if it took one second for that structure to go past my spacecraft, that distance is going to be one second times 400 kilometers a second, about 400 kilometers. So if you look at, say, distances of 400 kilometers or bigger in the solar wind, that distance is much bigger than the, the proton gyro radius. The proton gyro radius, think about single particle motion in a magnetic field. Particles move in helices, and the radius of that helix is the gyro radius. If you're at scales much bigger than the proton gyro radius, MHD can be a very useful tool. It's a fluid description of the plasma in which the plasma is quasi-neutral, basically equal densities of, in the case of a proton-electron plasma, equal densities of protons and electrons. Uh, the displacement current is neglected. If you recall your ENM, the displacement current is what gives you electromagnetic waves, light waves. Uh, we're neglecting that because almost all the phenomena we're looking at involve signals that propagate at speeds much less than the speed of light. That's certainly true in solar wind turbulence. Uh, and in this case, we get to the following set of equations. This is actually the ideal MHD equations in which I've neglected all dissipative terms, like the viscosity I was mentioning before, or electrical resistivity, which we may come back to later. Here are the four equations. So the first one here is the continuity equation. And let me actually just tell you what the different variables are. Rho here is the density. V is the velocity. P is the pl plasma pressure. B is the magnetic field. Gamma is the ratio of specific heats. It's 5 thirds. You may remember adiabatic expansion. P goes like rho to the 5 thirds power. Well, that 5 thirds is the gamma right there. The top equation is the continuity equation. And let me just see if I'm doing this. Yeah, let's, let's talk about these in turn. Uh, the continuity equation represents mass conservation. It's quick to see this if you remember your vector calculus. Think about it the following way. Take some volume in space. Call it volume omega and integrate that top equation over volume omega. If I integrate mass density over that volume, I get the mass inside that volume. If I integrate partial rho partial t over that volume, I'm getting the time derivative of the mass in my volume omega. So I integrate this equation over my volume omega. The left-hand side is the time rate of change of that mass inside that volume. What about the right-hand side? Well, I integrate a divergence over my volume. If you remember your vector calc in Gauss's theorem, the integral of a divergence over a volume is the surface integral of this quantity in parentheses, and don't forget the minus sign, over the surface bounding that volume. But what is that quantity in parentheses? Rho times V, mass density times the velocity. This is actually a super critical concept. I won't go through it here, but if you aren't really familiar with it, I leave it to you as an exercise. If you take a density of some quantity, multiply it by the speed at which the quantity is moving. The result, the product, is the flux of that quantity. It's the rate at which that quantity goes through a surface per unit area per unit time. 
That's what that rho v is. It's the mass flux. If you integrate that mass flux over the boundary of this volume, you're getting the, with the minus sign, you're getting the rate at which mass is flowing into your volume. So this top equation is just a fancy way of saying the time rate of change of the mass in any volume is the rate at which mass is flowing into that volume. That's a continuity equation. The second equation is Newton's second law, which <coughs> is written in maybe an unusual form if you haven't studied fluid dynamics before. The left-hand side is basically ma. Okay? The m is rho. Well, actually, it's really Newton's second law per unit volume. So it's mass density. This quantity in parentheses is the acceleration. And at first, you might be saying, if you haven't seen this before, well, wait a second. The acceleration is the time derivative of the velocity. This is the acceleration, and this is something else that I've just thrown in there without any justification. Well, it turns out there is a justification for this. This first term isn't really any kind of acceleration you would think about for mechanics. What is it? The partial time derivative is the time rate of change of the velocity at a fixed point in space. Think about mechanics, right? If you take a ball and you throw it and you ask what's its acceleration, we're not thinking about the velocity of that ball at a fixed point in space. We're thinking about the velocity of the ball as it moves. So if you want to take the, the time rate of change of the velocity at its own position, you have to use the chain rule, right? You have v as a function of position x and t, but x is a function of t. Let's see if this. If you have v of x of t and t, and you take the time derivative of this, apply the chain rule, you get the partial derivative of v with respect to t. And then you take the derivative of x with respect to t, dotted into the gradient of v, just by the chain rule. This is dx dt, where x is now a function of t. This x of t, what is this? Here we're focusing in on one particular fluid element, or one particular element of plasma, and watching it as it moves. And its position is x of t. And the time derivative of x is v. And so that quantity, partial v, partial t, plus v dot grad v, that's just the acceleration. It's sometimes called the Lagrangian time derivative or the convective time derivative. So that's ma per unit volume. On the right is just the forces per unit volume. You have a pressure force, minus grad p. It's a force that pushes from high pressure regions to low pressure regions. Two other forces. The first is gra minus grad b squared over 8 pi. That's called the magnetic pressure force. What does it do? Well, it does the exact same thing that the pressure force does. It pushes from regions of high magnetic pressure to regions of low magnetic pressure. How do I know that it does the exact same thing as a regular pressure does? Well, mathematically, b squared over 8 pi is playing the exact same role that p does. Right? We're taking minus grad of each of those. So it works in exactly the same way as pressure. This last term here is the magnetic tension force, b dot grad b. It turns out. That's a force that arises. If you have a magnetic field line that's bent, that force tries to straighten out the magnetic field line. It's called the magnetic tension force. Those are the, the two forces in MHD from the magnetic field. This next equation here is an adiabatic condition. Again, you see this combination, partial, partial t plus v dot grad. That's another time derivative following a fluid element. In this case, instead of taking a time derivative of the velocity itself, we're taking a time derivative of this quantity, which is related to the specific entropy. Actually, if we took the logarithm of this quantity, we'd have the specific entropy. But we don't need to do that here because the time derivative is 0 anyway. This is just saying there's no heat flow in the plasma. You can have more sophisticated energy equations, but we don't need them for our purposes today. The final equation here is basically Ohm's law for a perfectly conducting plasma. If you remember from freshman physics, Ohm's law can be written that the electric field is, say, equal to the resistivity. Or res let me put this, well, some constant. I'm using resistivity in a slightly different way in a moment. The electric field is some constant proportional to the resistivity times the current density. So in this case, if you set the, the resistivity equal to 0, you would just get the electric field is 0 for a perfectly conducting object. These plasmas are basically perfectly conducting. And so we want to set E equals 0, except we have to remember that the plasma is moving. And so we don't want the electric field in our laboratory frame to vanish. 
we want the electric field to vanish in the frame of the plasma. The electric field in the frame of the plasma is just E plus V cross V over C, where V is the plasma velocity. Take the curl of that, use Faraday's law, you get this equation. I can, if you have questions about that, I'll be happy to tell you after the talk is over. All right, I said this about the magnetic forces. The last equation, that induction equation, or Ohm's law, this one has a very important consequence, and that consequence is called the frozen in-law. And the frozen in-law states that if you think about the magnetic field lines in an ideal MHD plasma, they are like threads that are frozen to the plasma. They move with the plasma. So at, you know, as the plasma vects around, the, the field lines are just entrained in that. They're frozen to the plasma. That's violated when you put in resistivity. And you're going to hear later in this school about a spectacular violation of that law called magnetic reconnection, which you may well have heard of before. Let me actually, before I go further, just say that if we put together these two ideas of the frozen in-law and magnetic tension, we recover the idea of the Alphane wave that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So think about a, mag a plasma with initially a uniform magnetic field, just straight up and down. And now imagine I take part of the plasma and I move it to your left, just in the, just in the middle here. I move it to the left. What's going to happen to the field lines? The field lines are frozen to the plasma, so they're going to go like this. They're going to bend, right? But then the magnetic tension force comes into play and pulls that plasma back. But when it gets back to its initial position, it's moving, so it keeps going until it gets over here and magnetic tension pulls it back. The whole thing is going to oscillate back and forth like a wave. That wave is the Alphane wave. It's like a wave on a string where the magnetic field line is playing the role of the string. All right, a bit more about waves and terminology. Let's imagine we have a wave delta V in the plasma, is some constant times the following sinusoidal function, k dot x, x is position, k is the wave vector, minus omega t, omega is the angular frequency, t is time, phi naught is just some constant. This is just a, a monochromatic sinusoidal wave propagating in direction k. The wavelength is 2 pi over k. I'll talk, uh, I talked before about decreasing lambda, how eddies were breaking up into smaller eddies, how you had a cascade of energy from large eddies to small eddies, or large scales to small scales. In other words, their scale lambda was decreasing. At the same time, lambda decreases, k is increasing. So the energy cascade is energy moving to higher k. Lower lambda, higher k. So if you go back to those power spectra here, this frequency, as I was saying before, is actually proportional to the wave number the spatial wave number of the plasma, of the turbulence in the plasma frame. So energy transporting to smaller scales or cascading to smaller scales corresponds to energy moving to the right in this plot. That's the energy, the energy cascade as energy moving to the right in a plot of the power spectrum like that. But continuing here, and I will shortly give you a break, a five minute break. Um, Let's, let me just say one last thing about waves, and then we'll break. Let's consider an example of MHD waves at low beta. Beta is the ratio of the plasma pressure, P, to the magnetic pressure, B squared over 8 pi. In the solar corona, it's much less than 1. Magnetic pressure dominates. The sound speed, this is the adiabatic sound speed, is given by this expression, square root of gamma P over rho. I'll leave that as an exercise to you, or I'll be happy to talk to you about that after the talk is over, if you want to know how do you derive this. Alphane speed, I'll actually show you a derivation of where this comes from later in this talk, but it's b over the square, pi, square root of 4 pi rho. This alphane speed is the speed at which that alphane wave propagates along the field lines. The stronger the field, the faster the wave moves. The bigger the mass density, the more inertia there is for the oscillation to be pulled back, and so the slower it moves. This beta here turns out as cs squared over va squared. So when beta is small, the sound speed is small compared to the alphane speed. Also, the thermal speed of the plasma, which is just like square root of p over rho. At low beta, the thermal speed is much less than the alphane speed. In my talk tomorrow, I'm going to make use of that fact. And the fact that I mentioned that even once will give me license tomorrow to assume you're completely familiar with the, the idea that at low beta, thermal velocities are small compared to alphane speeds. All right, so at low beta, what are the waves. There are three. Well, in adiabatic plasma,
There's a fourth, the entropy mode, which I can also talk to you about later. But it doesn't exist in this, um, in say a uniform, uh, constant uh, entropy plasma. So uh, three waves, the Alphane wave, fast magnetosonic wave, and slow magnetosonic wave. They're illustrated here via their effects on the magnetic field lines at low beta. The Alphane wave is this wave on a string I was talking about before. It's just going to propagate up along the magnetic field line at the Alphane speed. The fast magnetosonic wave at low beta involves velocities that are perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. At low beta, the slow magnetosonic wave involves velocities that are parallel to the magnetic field lines. Because the magnetic field is frozen to the flow, the fast magnetosonic wave perturbs the magnetic field lines. But the slow magnetosonic wave does not. All right. What are these three terms here? These three terms here describe the force that arises to restore the, the plasma to its initial position. Like when you have a wave, you have an oscillation. You, dis, you d disturb a, a medium, but then it, it wants to spring back because of some force. Which force? For the Alphane wave, it's magnetic tension. For the fast magnetosonic wave, it's magnetic pressure. Because when you compress perpendicular to the magnetic field, you bunch up the magnetic field lines together. When the field lines get closer, the field gets stronger the magnetic pressure goes up, and then it pushes you back out. The slow magnetosonic wave is much more like the ordinary sound wave. Compress the, magnetic, the plasma along the magnetic field, that compression is going to increase the pressure, and then that pressure pushes you back. And this is the dispersion relation. Omega is k parallel VA. k parallel, I, I showed it. k parallel here is the component of the wave vector along the magnetic field. K perp is the component of the wave vector perpendicular to the magnetic field. The Alphane wave, its frequency depends only on K parallel. This, this relation of omega to K is called the dispersion relation of the wave. For the fast magnetosonic wave at low beta, the dispersion relation is omega equals KVA. It looks like the same dispersion relation as the Alphane wave, but it's not. Instead of K parallel, you have K, the full length of the wave vector. The slow magnetosonic wave, omega is k parallel CS, that is like the Alphane wave dispersion relation, except that we have the sound speed showing up instead of the Alphane speed. And at low beta, CS is small compared to VA, so these slow waves are indeed slow compared to the, even the Alphane wave at low beta. All right. One last thing. Uh, oh, actually, I, I have a couple last things, and I'll give you the break. Alphane waves are virtually undamped in the collisionless solar wind. Fast waves and slow waves are both damped by wave-particle interactions. I'll talk to you more about wave-particle interactions tomorrow. But they're, they're interactions which remove fast wave and slow wave energy from the, the solar wind. A couple properties of the Alphane waves. It turns out that the fluctuating velocity is plus or minus the fluctuating magnetic field divided by the square root of 4 pi rho naught. Rho naught is the background density. This is for alpha and waves propagating in the minus plus B naught direction. And delta rho is equal to 0 here. So if delta V is plus delta B over square root of 4 pi rho naught, the alpha wave is moving in the minus B naught direction, and vice versa. Now, this is connecting to this plot I showed you earlier. You know how we had before these correlated velocity and magnetic field measurements? That's exactly what you would expect for alpha waves. And in fact, here in this data, where we have BR is positively correlated with VR, the sign here is plus, these are alpha waves moving in the minus B naught direction. But for this data, the magnetic field, say of the Parker spiral that Professor Longcope was talking to you about this morning, that Parker spiral field was in towards the sun. So these are alpha waves that are moving away from the sun in the plasma frame. That's what you might expect if the sun was somehow launching alpha waves into the solar wind. They would be propagating away from the sun by causality. And that's what we see. This it was actually this Belcher and Davis paper was a landmark paper. It's a famous paper. They were the first ones to really find this strong correlation, strong evidence for alpha waves originating at the sun. Now, as we go into the final part of this talk, I'm going to talk to you about some more of the intricate details of how these waves become turbulent in the solar wind um, and their possible role in accelerating the solar wind. But why don't we take a five minute break here uh, and then we'll come back to that. But before we break, any questions on what I've been discussing? All right, five minutes, then we'll continue. 
All right, why don't we get started again? So I had really wanted to be very mean and hit you with a lot of turbulence phenomenology, but I'm being defeated by my own inefficiency at getting through these materials. So I will endeavor to go as quickly as I can, reasonably, to cover more material. But I will say the following thing. In preparing these slides, the slides are not just for this talk. It's that they're actually kind of a document that you can use to work your way through various turbulence paradigms. And you're going to have access to these talks at least after my second talk tomorrow. Uh, they'll be made available to you. So the material I don't get through, if you're intrigued by this, you want to learn why do these power spectra have these forms, what are the arguments, the, the slides that are in this presentation are at least one roadmap for you to get started uh, on it. Uh, but let's see how far we get. Again, the motivation, how does this potentially, we, we just saw a moment ago, we have alphane waves here. There's evidence that these were generated at the sun, propagating away from the sun. Why is that interesting? Well, let's go back and look at what happened to the sun, at the sun. As you were learning about this morning, where did the solar wind come from? It came from excess heating of the corona, which is adding energy, which is escaping via this outflow. Well, this turbulence is one leading candidate for the mechanism that provides that extra energy to the corona driving the solar wind. How would that work? It would work by the sun, this is one model, the sun launching alphane waves, basically convective motions in the sun's photosphere, shaking the, the foot points of the magnetic field lines, launching alphane waves out, like waves on a string, out into the solar atmosphere and solar wind. Those waves becoming turbulent, the energy of that turbulence cascading to small scales and dissipating, heating the plasma, increasing the, the thermal pressure of the plasma, which then pushes the plasma away from the sun, giving you a solar wind. All right, time permitting, I'll say more about this at the end, but that was just motivational. I now want to get back to some of the, some more of the details. Uh, these are, this is now getting into the harder stuff. We're not going to finish this, so that's a given. Interrupt me if there are things I'm saying that you don't follow. It will, and I'll try to clarify. So we're talking about how alphane waves are likely a dominant form of the energy in the solar wind turbulence. Why, do, because, why is that? Because of that great correlation between the velocity and magnetic field fluctuations shown in that plot, which is what we expect for alphane waves. Let's use a simplified form of magnetohydrodynamics that lets us focus on the alphane waves. This is incompressible MHD. This is not what the solar wind is, but it's a useful theoretical tool for understanding the dynamics of alphane wave fluctuations, which is what we're going to try to do now. So here, it's the same equations before, pretty much. Newton's second law, induction equation. Here's, here are some non-ILD ideal terms, a viscous term, a resistive term. In incompressible MHD, the divergence of the velocity is zero, which is also satisfied by alphane waves. And the density is a constant. Now, these viscous terms and uh, resistive terms, they involve the Laplacian, del squared. When is del squared a big term? Del squared is a big term when the quantity it's operating on varies on very short length scales. That's why viscosity is great at damping out really small scale eddies. Likewise, resistivity will be good at damping out very small scale magnetic structures. Uh, they'll be important at very small scales. Turns out, and this is a, if you're interested in turbulence, I strongly encourage you to do the exercise of going from this slide to this slide. Just introduce the following variables. Magnetic field's a background, magnetic field in the z direction, plus a fluctuation, the alphane speed you've seen before. Define lowercase b. It's the magnetic fluctuation divided by the square root of 4 pi rho. That converts this in CGS units to a velocity unit. The total pressure divided by density, capital pi, that's plasma plus magnetic pressure divided by rho. And then these quantities that are called the Elsasser variables, this is the Elsasser variables, a plus or minus v plus or minus lowercase b. Substitute this in to the incompressible MHD equations, and you get this single equation. That's actually two equations. You can either read the top sign or the bottom sign in those subscripts. Now, what does this equation tell you? It tells you some really interesting things about the system. First of all, it tells you that if you had very small amplitude fluctuations, make A, this quantity here, infinitesimal. That means that this term here, it's this nonlinear term, it becomes quadratically infinitesimal. We neglect it. Then neglect this pressure term here by, say, taking the curl of this equation, just annihilate. 
So the, say the right hand side is zero. What is this equation? This is an advection equation. This is an equation describing a quantity a plus or minus that moves in the z direction at speed, at velocity, you know, minus plus VA. These quantities, A plus or minus, are the Alfane wave amplitudes. A plus is, a, is an Alfane wave moving in the minus Z direction at speed VA. A minus is a fluctuation moving in the plus Z direction at speed VA. So that's the meaning of the Elsasser variables. They are the amplitudes of Alfane waves. So that's the first very interesting thing that this formulation tells you. There's another really critical thing that this equation tells you. It is related to the form of the nonlinear term. So the nonlinear term is the thing that gives you turbulence. Now, how can you know that? How can you easily verify that for yourself? Well, think about, again, the system where we neglect the right-hand side. So we get a linear equation. With linear equations, if I have two different solutions, say wave one and wave two, the sum of those solutions is also a solution if it's a linear equation. If I have 10 waves, each is a solution to the equation. The sum of those 10 waves is also a solution. In other words, the waves aren't going to change each other. Waves can just propagate through each other without seeing each other. It's like light waves in vacuum. In order to get waves to interact with each other, in order to get alphane wave eddies to cascade to small scales, the different waves have to talk to each other. They do so through the nonlinear term. This is the key to turbulence. Now, look at the form of that term. There's an A minus plus dot grad A plus minus. So consider the case where the only thing I have is, say, A plus, like in the Belcher-Davis plot. What happens to the nonlinear term? It's dead, right? Because if all I have is A plus, when I take A minus dot grad A plus, A minus is zero. There's no nonlinear term. Now, actually, in the Belcher-Davis plot, a minus wasn't really zero, it's just small. But let's pretend for the moment that we have a system where A minus is actually zero. There are no nonlinear interactions. That's actually a striking result. E, no matter how big I make A plus, no matter how big the wave amplitude gets in incompressible MHD, it remains, if I just have A plus, it remains a solution, a nonlinear wave solution. So what else can I learn from this? It tells me that if I want turbulence in alphane waves, I need to have collisions between counterpropagating alphane waves. I need A plus, and I also need A minus. I need to have both if they're going to interact with each other through the nonlinear term. That's very important. I'll tell you a little bit more about that right at the end of this talk. OK, several slides we're going to skip now. This is supplementary material for you to review. Conserved quantities in ideal MHD, energy, magnetic helicity, cross helicity, jargon. But you can read about a little bit about this in the next few slides. I'm going to skip ahead and focus a bit on the most interesting bits. I want to get to this whole, pro this whole idea of the energy cascade. We talked about the energy cascade in hydrodynamic turbulence, eddies breaking up into smaller eddies. Let's go back to the hydro case before venturing to the MHD case. Can we describe the power spectrum of hydrodynamic turbulence just from a simple picture like this? It turns out we can. These are some, through some very powerful arguments from Komolgorov. This is a version of his argument. Consider delta V lambda. Define it to be the RMS amplitude of the velocity difference across a spatial separation lambda. So you have an, an eddy of size lambda that's churning over at velocity delta V lambda. The cascade time is tau sub c. The eddy turnover time is the size of the eddy lambda divided by the time the, the speed at which it's rotating or turning over, this lambda over delta V lambda. This is actually an important point. The, the cascade, this, the idea here is that the energy, this eddy is going to break up after it turns over once. OK, now why did I say it turns over once? Why not maybe it has to turn over twice or 1.3 times? Well, the kind of arguments I'm using here are called scaling arguments. We're actually not interested in those factors of order two or three. We, we just want to get the rough proportionality. That basic idea is that if you want to know how long does it take a hydrodynamic eddy to break up, it's basically the time for it to turn over. And so on that time, what's going to happen? The eddy breaks up into smaller eddies. It gives up its energy to smaller eddies. The power is the rate at which eddies of size lambda are giving their energy up to the eddies of, say, size lambda over 2. That rate is energy 
I'm just going to use energy per unit mass here, energy delta V lambda squared over the time it takes to give up that energy, plug in the value for tau C, you get that the cascade power is delta V lambda cubed over lambda. Now, in the inertial range, defined on the, defined on the previous slide that I skipped over for time's sake, the inertial range is the following. Imagine we stir our liquid at some large scale L. Imagine that the eddies ultimately dissipate via viscosity at some small scale D. The scales intermediate between D and L are the inertial range. Scales that are much bigger than the dissipation scale. Scales that are much smaller than the forcing scale. When turbulence spans orders of magnitude and scale length, you still have a lot of inertial range. So these are scales at which we don't really, aren't really sensitive to the details of the forcing. We aren't because we're at scales much smaller than the, the forcing length scale. We're not sensitive to the details of the viscous dissipation because eddies at this scale don't feel viscosity very much. In this inertial range, epsilon is independent of lambda. It has to be that way. Say I have eddies of size in some unit, 8, 4, and 2. If the rate at which the eddies of size, eddies of size 8 give energy to the eddies of size 4 is not the same as the rate at which eddies of size 4 give energy to eddies of size 2, what's going to happen? I'm going to build up energy in the eddies of size 4, which I can't do in steady state. Steady state has everything steady. So that energy cascade power is constant. It's independent of lambda. Delta V cubed over lambda is independent of lambda. That means that delta V lambda is proportional to lambda to the one third. This is a famous Kolmogorov scaling of hydrodynamic turbulence, and it takes three lines to obtain. Very important, powerful argument. This next slide explains how lambda being proportional to, delta V being proportional to lambda to the one third is equivalent to your power spectrum being proportional to k to the minus 5 thirds, where k is wave number. Again, you have access to the slides. I'm going to let you read this on your own time later. I'm going to give you now the punchline. The total kinetic energy in velocity fluctuations per unit mass is given by this. E of k is the power spectrum, amount of energy, kinetic energy per unit k. So what do I mean? when I say the mean square velocity fluctuation at length scale lambda, i.e. this delta V lambda. Well, its square is basically all the energy between wave number 0.5 K1 and 2 K1, where lambda is 1 over K1. So basically, this delta V square, this energy per unit mass, is part of the full energy per unit mass. It's the part that's contained within an interval of wave numbers that uh, is, like, has a logarithmic width of order unity. So it's like a factor of two or three or four in k space. Now, what is that to order of magnitude? We don't care about factors of two or three. This integral is roughly the interval size, 1.5k or 1.5k1, k or really like k1, times the integrand. So delta V lambda squared is like K1 times E. But if delta V is like lambda to the 1 third, which is K1 to the minus 1 third, the left hand side is K1 to the minus 2 thirds. Divide by K, E of K goes like K to the minus 5 thirds. That's this other incredibly famous turbulence result from Kolmogorov. As I was saying before, if we were talking about power spectra seen in a spacecraft, Frequency is proportional to wave number because of Taylor's frozen flow hypothesis. This is the same argument that would give you P of F is proportional to F to the minus 5 thirds if it happened that the solar wind were a hydrodynamic turbulent system. It's not hydrodynamic, but ironically, this argument still works for reasons that are contained in the lecture notes, which unfortunately I won't have time to do full justice to. But let me see if I can still, still get further along. This is the case of hydro. How? Yes, question. Are you referring to this last part here where it says that the velocity, flux, the velocity power spectrum is a little different than the magnetic? This is a, an excellent question, and I don't think anyone has a great understanding. The, one of the, the things that might solve that is there's something called residual energy. The difference in the energy between the velocity and magnetic fluctuations, even in this type of incompressible turbulence or reduced MHD turbulence or alpha wave turbulence, that energy difference 
tends to scale like k to the minus 2. So at large scales, you have an excess of magnetic energy over kinetic energy. But the difference is dropping off faster than either energy individually. So the spectra look like the magnetic spectrum is a bit steeper. The velocity spectrum is a bit flatter. That's one possible explanation. But people are still trying to figure this out. All right, alpha N wave turbulence. I will start walking along the path to trying to take these hydrodynamic arguments and apply them to MHD. Let's see how far we get. And again, I wrote these slides with the idea that you could go through them to kind of figure this out on your own. And I'll be around tomorrow also if you want to read any of this tonight and ask me questions. I'll be happy to talk about it. All right, so the basic idea, I'm going to skip through some slides here. The basic idea, let's take this Elsasser equation of MHD, just bring the nonlinear term to the left. You get this equation, say, for A minus. This equation is a very interesting equation because, as I was saying before, if you have a, an equation of the form partial partial t of whatever, in this case, A minus, whatever you want, partial partial t of some quantity, plus some velocity dot grad of that quantity. That's called an advection equation. That's an equation that you get when whatever quantity appears here and here is being advected, is basically traveling at this velocity. So this equation says that the A minus wave field, the, the wave field describing all the alpha waves propagating in one direction along the background magnetic field, those waves move along the background field plus along this perturbation, which is associated with the oppositely directed wave packet, the, the waves coming in the opposite direction. A minus is advected by A plus. Turns you out, you can show that what's actually happening is that the A minus wave field is following a special kind of magnetic field line. It's not the magnetic field lines of the background magnetic field, which are all straight. It's the magnetic field lines that you would get if you added up the background field in the z direction plus the counter propagating alpha waves. And it turns out that the, the way that the wave packets displace the field lines is the key to understanding nonlinear alpha and wave, alpha and wave interactions. It's the key to understanding how the alpha and wave eddies break up. Let me show you what I mean. So let's think about what a wave packet might look like in MHD. So here we have a magnetic field B naught to the right and a delta B which is up in this region. Construct the resulting magnetic field lines. One of them is going to look like this. Right? Straight. The, the, the delta B is limited to this region. Out here, the field line is straight. Out here, it's straight. In the, between, the magnetic field is angling up and to the right, because we have B naught to the right and delta B up. So here's an example of a field line. Now, suppose we're talking about an A minus wave packet. So V is minus B. In here, the wave packet is moving down. So this solid line changes into the dashed line. This is a wave packet moving to the right. Okay, that's just an example of an A minus wave packet along a single field line. How about in 3D? Let's now consider the same picture we had on the last page. That's this line here. That field line represents the field line in the front of that cube, the front face of that cube, where delta B is pointing up. In the back face of that cube, delta B is pointing down. So the field lines there come from the left, and then they glance downward, and then they go out to the right. And then the field lines are horizontal outside of the wave packet, because everywhere else there's no delta B. And again, if I have V is minus B, this whole cube is going to propagate to the right without distortion. Now, I said before that the alpha and wave cascade arises from collisions between oppositely directed wave packets. Let's see how this plays out. Here's the wave packet I just illustrated to you where the field lines are going up in the front of the wave packet, and they deflect downward at the rear face of the wave packet. That's the A minus wave packet I was just talking about. Let's consider a similar wave packet, same structure of the magnetic field, but flip the sign of V. So the one on the right is actually an A plus wave packet, which moves to the left. Those are two wave packets that are going to collide. What happens when they collide? Well, the fluctuations follow the field lines obtained by adding B naught to the magnetic field of the other wave packet. So each of these wave packets is going to follow the field lines of the opposite wave packet. The one on the right comes in to the right. It hits this. The front face of it goes down this. 
slope here. The front face gets sheared downward. The rear face of this A plus wave packet comes along and it hits this field line and it gets sheared up. So the A plus wave packet after the collision is going to look like this. It got sheared. The A minus wave packet goes to the right and it gets sheared into this. The front face of this A minus wave packet goes up when it hits this field line here. The back side of this A minus wave packet goes along that field line. It hits this and it goes down. So these field lines are sheared. What happens if you put a bunch of these collisions in a row? You're going to have this random shearing of these wave packets, which is going to be what causes the cascade. You can see this very nicely in a result from a paper in 2001 by Marone and Goldreich, who carried out direct numerical simulations of incompressible MHD turbulence. And they did the following experiment. They put in their simulation that one cross, the magnetic field was, say, to your left. And they considered a bullseye target of A, let's say, A minus field lines at one plane. And they propagated that wave forward <clears throat> along the field lines obtained by the background magnetic field added to the A plus fluctuations, which are illustrated here. That field line, that, sorry, that bullseye target, as it propagates further and further along this complicated turbulent magnetic field, that pattern, bullseye pattern of the wave packet gets sheared and distorted. And you can see whereas the initial perpendicular length scale of this wave packet is the radius of that bullseye. Down here, after it's propagated through these field lines, you get really small perpendicular scale perpendicular structure. The energy you started with at large scales has been effectively transported or cascaded to smaller scales purely by this transport along these complicated magnetic trajectories. We can get to a couple more interesting tidbits about um, how this works. Let's consider the case of weak MHD turbulence. And weak MHD turbulence, you have these collisions, but no single collision is enough to do very much damage. So basically, during any single collision, you might have, say, a 1% change in the structure of a wave packet. What does that mean? Well, that means that when two of these wave packets collide, let's consider the wave packet here on the right, this A plus wave packet, it comes in to the left, and it's distorted by the A minus wave packet. But because the A minus wave packet isn't changed very much when it goes through the A plus wave packet, the trailing edge of the A plus wave packet, when it reaches the A minus wave packet, it sees the same A minus wave packet that was seen by the leading edge of the A plus wave packet. In other words, the leading and trailing edges of the A plus wave packet are going to be sheared in exactly the same way in weak MHD turbulence. Now, when that happens, what does that mean? It means that you cannot change the parallel structure of the wave packet. The front gets changed in the, back, the same way as the back. But you can shear it in the plane perpendicular to the background magnetic field. And what that means, this is actually another critical point about MHD turbulence, is that when we talk about a cascade of energy in MHD turbulence, it's not like hydrodynamic turbulence. In hydrodynamic turbulence, you're, you're breaking up eddies into smaller eddies. And if you had a you know, just homogeneous hydrodynamic turbulence, there's no preferred direction. It's very different in MHD turbulence. If you have a, a uniform background magnetic field, because of this phenomenon I was just describing about weak MHD turbulence, there's a preference for energy to cascade to small perpendicular scales, measured in the directions perpendicular to the background field. So if the background field is to your right, you'll get small variations measured in the vertical direction. Eddies that, that very rapidly perpendicular to that background field. But not, per, not fluctuations that are varying very rapidly along the direction of the background magnetic field. And you can understand that result in a physical, conceptual way by this argument that I just gave. There's also a mathematical way to get at it, too, that I could talk to you about after the talk if you're interested. Now, I only have five minutes left. And I have here the remaining, let me just glance through this. I'll show you what you're missing. But this is all here for you. You have access to it. And I laid it out so it's step by step. You can walk, it, walk yourself through all of these arguments to get it to a couple of the leading models to describe this power spectra of turbulence in the solar wind. 
I'm going to finish, though, with one final thing, which is a little less into the nitty gritty and more into the big picture. We started talking about solo wind structure. Let's finish talking about solo wind. So how does this turbulence really play out in the solar wind? There's one more wrinkle that I want to introduce you to. I showed you this before. Three-stage process for launching the solar wind via alphane wave turbulence. Stage one, sun launches alphane waves. Think convective motion, shaking field lines. It also could be magnetic reconnection, for those of you who are familiar with reconnection. Reconnection can launch waves as well. Those alphane waves propagate away from the sun. They become turbulent. Energy cascades to small scales. The waves dissipate. They heat the plasma. That increases the pressure. That could be, for example, the, the heating mechanism that Professor Longcope was talking about this morning that ultimately drives the heating of the corona and the heating of the solar wind. Here's a movie showing you some evidence for alphane waves in the low corona. This is a movie taken from a publication by Bart de Pontieu and colleagues. And this is basically white light scattering uh, in the low corona off the limb of the sun. You see bright linear features. Those are regions of enhanced electron density. They're linear striated features because the electrons can move rapidly along the magnetic field lines, but not perpendicular to the magnetic field line. So in density enhancements tend to be aligned with the magnetic field. So you're seeing these filamentary wider you know, filaments are in higher den electron density regions that are tracing out the background magnetic field direction. You can see this kind of wavy motion back and forth of those linear structures. These authors measured the delta V associated with that wavy motion by tracking features. As I was saying before, the density of a quantity times the speed at which it's invected gives you the flux of that quantity. Rho delta V squared is the energy density of the alphane waves. VA is the alphane speed, the speed at which the energy is invected. They measured all three quantities. They found the energy flux in this field of fluctuations is about 10 to the 5 ergs per centimeter squared per second. That's what you need to power the fast solar wind. So a very important observation to establish the plausibility of this type of wave as a mechanism for generating the solar wind. How do they become turbulent? As I was saying before, alphane waves interact to produce turbulence only when they're counter-propagating. By causality, the sun can only produce outward propagating waves. It doesn't produce directly inward propagating waves. We need a source of inward propagating waves to get alphane wave turbulence. What is that source of inward propagating waves? One of the leading ideas is wave reflection. Because the alphane speed changes fairly rapidly with radius distance from the sun, the alphane waves undergo linear reflection. Some fraction of them are reflected back towards the sun, and that can create the mix of counterpropagating waves that you need. There's a lot of work that has gone into to studying that process. I'm going to skip over some of the, the stuff that's in these notes that shows you a little bit about the approach um, uh, that you can use for, for actually, in fact, one of my colleagues, Jean Perez, and I have a paper just accepted on numerical simulations of this process uh, of waves being launched by the sun, partially reflecting and becoming turbulent, and analyzing the properties of that turbulence. It will be coming out in the Journal of Plasma Physics sometime, I believe, uh, in the next several months. All right. So this is the study I just mentioned in press is one of many, many studies of this process. There are lots of detailed models that suggest that this turbulence really could be an important ingredient in uh, accelerating the solar wind close to the sun. But how will we ever be able to really tell? Uh, and I hear I want to insert my whiny voice and say, how can we tell the solar wind acceleration region is so far away? We'll never be able to know. Well, it was impossible up until last year. August 12th, NASA launched the Parker Solar Probe. This is a, a slide showing this uh, beautiful launch, the probe not returning to Earth, but actually just seeing it look like that. It's beginning its first approach to, to the sun. And it will eventually reach within 10 solar radii of the sun. The closest we'd been before was 60 solar radii via Helios. This mission is going to provide the first ever in situ measurements of turbulence, plasma properties in the solar wind acceleration region. And that mission is already producing some very interesting results that will be out by this year's AGU. There are papers already 
in that have already been submitted and there will be more submitted this this fall that are beginning so far that the, the uh, probe has only gotten into 37 solar radii but over the next several years it will eventually through multiple Venus flybys get into as close as 10 or less than 10 solar radii from the Sun and test a lot of these models about the importance uh, of different mechanisms uh, for heating and accelerating the solar wind uh, and there's a there's a picture of the, the Parker solar probe so just before I end I just want to mention again there's a fair amount more material in this in these slides that I didn't have time to get to but which you might find a useful tutorial introduction to the 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 field if you want to pursue it more I'm around through tomorrow happy to talk about any of this stuff and I've left a list of a number of other references that you might also want to peruse for further um, for further reading and I'll finish there thank you Any questions for your much deserved break? Yes. No, that's actually a really interesting question. There is an example of total internal reflection, but not for the Alphane wave, for the fast magnetosonic wave. It turns out, so in the in the chromosphere, like right above the sun, think about the, the atmosphere of the sun. You have the photosphere where things are still pretty dense, then a big drop off in density through the chromosphere. And in the chromosphere, the, the density is dropping exponentially with, with height. At the top of the chromosphere, right below the corona, you have this thing called the, the transition region, this layer where the density drops by a factor of 100 when you transition from chromosphere to corona. Now, as the density is going down, and when it drops by that factor of 100, the alphane speed goes up a lot by a factor of square root of rho, or 1 over square root of rho, by a factor of 10. What happens when the alphane speed increases that much? Well, it turns out for the fast wave, because of its dispersion relation, which is proportional not just to omega is not just k parallel VA, but kVA. If you think about what happens to a fast wave coming up from below in the chromosphere, it's going to come up, hit the transition region, and be undergo total internal reflection and go back in to the, the photosphere. And that is one reason why, for a long time, many physicists, and that, by the way, is a result found by Joel Holweg back in 1978. Um, and many physicists, for a long time, myself included, have been thinking that fast waves probably don't play a big role in heating the, the solar wind. I think the jury's out on that, though, because there could be other mechanisms for producing fast waves. And Parker Solar Probe is going to be providing information that will tell us whether that's true or not. In terms of the alphane waves, they don't undergo total internal reflection. Because of their, their dispersion relation, they just march up that, that uh, that field line at the alphane speed. The, and their reflection is a, a non-WKB effect. Total internal reflection is a WKB effect when the wave, it arises even when the wavelength is very small compared to the distance over which the fluctuations, the, 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 say the phase speed changes. The type of ref reflection that's involved for the alphane waves is something that is called non-WKB reflection. It only arises when the alphane wavelength in the radial direction gets really long. But because the motions on the sun are slow, characteristic time scales of five minutes, and the alphane speed is really large in the corona, it can be a couple thousand kilometers a second, you can have radial wavelengths for these alphane waves that are a solar radius or more. And in that case, they're no longer in this cl the classical WKB, re WKB regime. They're not small wavelength waves propagating in a nearly uniform medium. Their wavelength is sensing at either end different phase speeds. And that leads to non-WKB reflection. It's a partial reflection. And so it's not perfectly efficient. It just gives you some fraction of the, of the wave energy coming back in. Yes. This is another great question. Okay, so the one that I showed you, there are several ideas for the one I showed you, where at small scales you have f to the minus one, low free, sorry, small frequencies you have f to the minus one, larger frequencies f to the minus five thirds. In this case, the f to the minus five thirds is believed to be a variation of the Kolmogorov argument that we went through. Basically, Eddies breaking up into smaller eddies, you get f to the minus 5 thirds. Um, f to the minus 1, different ideas for that. One is that that's produced back at the sun. 
it's just the intrinsic way that the sun launches the waves. Another, which I'm very intrigued about, and particularly for the fast solar wind, is there's an instability called the parametric instability, in which an outward propagating alphane wave decays into an outward propagating slow magnetosonic wave and an inward propagating alphane wave. And when that instability it develops into a nonlinear stage, you can develop these one over F power spectra uh, in the solar wind. That's another possibility. Uh, there's another possibility that it could, I mentioned this reflection playing a role. There's this, this type of turbulence that can sometimes be called reflection-driven alphane wave turbulence. There are some models of this turbulence that give 1 over F power spectra. Um, but my own sense is that that is not a likely explanation for this based on the work that I've been doing on, on this problem. But the jury's out. Uh, and there's another argument that it has to do with uh, the, the fact that as delta B becomes of order B naught, you're sort of forced into this 1 over F power spectrum. Here I'm referring to work by Lorenzo Mattaini and colleagues. So, and the, the first person to uh, mention 1 over F as a, a model from uh, reflection-driven turbulence, that was a paper back in 89 by Marco Velli, uh, also Grappan and Manginet. So they're, they're competing models not known for what explains this break. At smaller scales, once you hit the dissipation scale, there's yet another break. It becomes even steeper. And there are other models for that that appeal to the, the change in the character of the fluctuation. Instead of alphane waves, you have kinetic alphane waves, for example. Dispersive fluctuations where you, you get a different phenomenology. At one AU, about a million kilometers. So about a percent of an AU. So an AU. 1.5 times 10 to the 13 centimeters, 150 million kilometers. So on the order of a percent of an AU would be a typical correlation at, length at, at Earth. And then as you go into the sun, it tends to get smaller. But it can also be an anisotropic correlation length close to the sun. You know, these, structure, these fluctuations are, are generated at the sun with a fairly small transverse size on the surface of the sun, which can be different from their radial extent, which tends to be controlled by the product of alphane speed times correlation time, which can greatly exceed the transverse scale of, say, solar granules when you're in the corona. Uh, so uh, as a function of R, it's not entirely clear what is the correlation length. Um, but at, at Earth, about a percent of an AU. Yes, uh, you can use um, radio scintillation, which will tell you about the density power spectra. And that's very interesting, because the density power spectra in the solar wind, there are, there are different contributions to the density fluctuations. Uh, part of it, uh, of the power, and actually, again, you see these power law spectra of the density. And part of that power law is probably due to something that's called passive scalar mixing. So take our canonical container of water. Add salt into the water and mix it up and you get turbulence. And ask, what's the power spectrum of the salt density fluctuations? It's going to be the same as that of the, vo of the velocity. It's going to be k to the minus 5 thirds. Uh, that's just because the salt is entrained in the flow and the energy in the fluctuations at different scales is, again, passed to smaller scales on the eddy turnover time. And the same kind of thing likely happens in the solar wind. And so you get this passive scalar um, you know, power, power spectrum. But then as you go to smaller scales, <laughs> excuse me, there are other contributions that can change, lead to departures from that perfect power law spectrum. As you get, for example, to the proton inertial length and below, you get an enhanced bump in that density power spectrum, again, from the, the dis now the kinetic nature, the dispersive nature of the fluctuations that arises at small scales. So yes, remote sense like radio has been used for that, for sure. All right, well, if any of you have any questions on any of these slides, do uh, feel free to ask uh, me questions. I've given you one more talk. It's going to be uh, even more technical than today's talk uh, tomorrow. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll be around tomorrow after that talk as well.